you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy 6 is where we'll be at. We start our lesson here shortly. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone, or if you don't know about it, to let you know that our summer series starts not this coming Wednesday, but the, the next Wednesday, and we're excited about it. Our theme for the summer series is What a Day. We're going to look at some of the uh, more um, biblically significant, you might say, or more memorable, perhaps, uh, events in biblical history, and try to, to imagine from Scripture and uh, in, in our minds, what would it have been like to have been present when that happened? The first one we're going to start with is, what would it have been like to be, to be present when God created? everything. Of course, no one was there when God created everything other than God because nothing was created yet. But what would it have been like to, to witness God's majesty, His power, His ability to simply speak and create everything? What would it have been like? And we're going to look at all, all kinds of, of different biblical, uh, significant biblical events. So there are some uh, invitation cards that look like this on the, uh, the welcome table in the foyer, I believe. They're still there. So if you want to grab one of those, pass them out. We already had uh, someone tell me this morning that uh, she gave one some, to somebody at the DMV. So if you can spread the gospel at the DMV, you can spread the gospel anywhere, okay? I mean, people there are certainly in need. Uh, so so take, take it wherever you're going uh, and spread it out wherever you can, okay? Uh, as we mentioned at the beginning of our service, and has been mentioned a couple of different times, tomorrow is Memorial Day. Uh, we appreciate that. We, we want to encourage everyone here to be thankful for our nation. But as I mentioned also in the beginning of our services, we want to make sure that as, as our, the families of those who, who gave their lives would want us to make sure that we make their sacrifice not in vain. We look at maybe people in your life who have given their lives in service to God, whether that means literally giving their life, which probably very few of us would be able to say that, or simply were faithful throughout their life uh, in service to the Lord. What would they want those that they served for God, what would they want that to, to result in? And they would want that to result in other people being faithful. Uh, and this morning I want us to think about specifically our, our children. What do today's children need? Uh, part of the reason for that is, if you haven't heard already, it's been mentioned already, Matthew Higginbotham's right over here. Uh, he's our summer youth intern this summer. He's going to be working primarily with our kids, though he'll be working with, with you adults as well. So uh, make sure that you get a chance to, to meet him. Uh, he is uh, interning with us. He, he's um, a, a Bible major at Freed Hardeman University in Tennessee, and he wants to be a, a minister one day. And he's getting some, some valuable experience with us here, and we're benefiting from his services uh, this year. This summer, So let's pray for him, pray for the, the work that he does, and certainly continue to pray for our congregation and our children in general. Uh, some significant research has been done by Barna Group and other such uh, survey groups that, that says that as many as 7 out of every 10 children, by the time they get to college, if they grew up in a church, and this is just Christendom in general across any uh, religious group that, that claims to be Christians, it said that as many as 7 out of every 10 children leave the faith. Many of them never to return. Some of them to return, but maybe to a different faith. Research has also been in, done within our fellowship, within the church. Uh, and the numbers aren't much better. The numbers in reality are about the same. And, and even, even more significantly for us is while it may say that, that seven out of every ten leave, but, but some of them may come back, generally the, the, the fact is they may come back, but they don't come back to the faith. They just go back to a faith. And we know the significance of that, don't we? That it's not just a faith in God, it's the faith in God. It's being obedient to the gospel. So here in my hand I have 41 pieces of paper that, to the best of my knowledge, with uh, my brain and the help of Facebook, these represent the children uh, that are in 12th grade and under here at Charlotte Avenue. So seven out of every ten pieces of paper of these, representing these children will fall away, will leave the faith, many of them never to return. And I want us to know what that's like. So I'm going to read names. And the ones that are those 7 out of 10, I'm going to drop them on the ground because they're gone. And again, this is just an exercise. And it is my hope and my prayer and the reason we're talking about it today that none of uh, the children that are here uh, in our assembly today would ever leave the faith. But the reality is that within Christendom, 7 out of every 10 leave. By the time they enter college, Many of them never to return. And the sad, sad fact is, within the church, the numbers are not much better. So do this with me. I'm going to mix them up. I mixed them up a little bit already. Um, I'm a little nervous because I have kids in this one. Stand up seven out of every ten. 
Travis, Zach, Seth, Lexi, Nyla, Emma, Hendrix, Riley Brewster. Briggs, Parker, Meredith, Kennedy, Hunter, Asher, Jacob, Chase, Jackson, Tyler, Avery, Riley Landrum, Logan, Jonah, Katie, Graceland, Harper, Hayden, Piper, Isaiah, Benjamin, and Grant. What if that happens? Now, to some of you, that doesn't mean a whole lot because you don't know those kids. Maybe you're visiting with us, or maybe those weren't your kids. But imagine if it was. What, what if that happens to those kids? And what if, what if, they, what if they leave and they, they never return? Or they return to a, a different faith which is not in, in line with the, with the Scriptures. What, what do today's children need? What do those children need that the numbers say with significant research throughout Christianity that 7 out of every 10 college students who grew up in the church, these are not, these are not kids that, that didn't grow up going to church somewhere, that didn't know the truth about God, that weren't exposed to the truth of Christianity. These are ones that, that were all of those things. Maybe even were, were part of, of, of big and, and significant youth groups or youth ministries or all those types of things. And these kids, for whatever reason, a multitude of factors... They leave. Many of them, most of them, never to return. What do they need? They need a lot. And I don't have time, uh, because you don't want to listen that long, uh, for all the things. And I don't have the knowledge to know all the things that they need. But let me suggest three things this morning uh, that today's children need. That not only, and again, that's significant because that means something to us. We already talked about uh, uh, we, we brought up the, the importance of, of uh, personal connection. So that means something to us. But there are millions of lost children in the world today that have either had a faith and lose it or never have a faith that they're in a lost state just as much as that represents those children. Number one, what do today's children need? Their own faith. They need their own faith derived or coming from a genuine exemplified faith. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, uh, in the Jewish community throughout the, the century since the writing of, of this book, it's known as the, the Shema. And it's, a, it, it's a, a prayer that was prayed oftentimes by those in the Jewish community, and it relates specifically to what we're talking about. And you know these verses, but let's listen to them again. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. What does he say? He says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart. And this was something that, that Moses said to the people. This is something that, again, uh, with this idea of the Shema, it was something that they, they regularly repeated. Maybe repeated in front of their children to remind them. Maybe they repeated to themselves to remind themselves. Why do they regularly repeat it? Because that's exactly what it says to do, right? It says, keep these things in, in front of you all the time. Love the Lord your God with everything you've got, all of your heart, all of your soul. All of your might. Have these commands on your heart, on your head, on your forehead, on your doorpost, and your gates. Always before your eyes. Always in your heart. Make sure they're ever present. Now listen, we love that idea, 
But in our life, in your life, how often do you regularly have the Word of God in front of you? There are so many things we place in front of ourselves. And some of them we have to, and I understand that. We've got to go to work. We've got to do our jobs. We've got to take care of our family. We've got to make dinner. We've got to drive. And it's hard to read the Bible when you're driving. I don't suggest it. There's all kinds of things we have to do. I understand that. But how often do you purposefully make sure that when you are going throughout your day, there's God? There's God. There's God. Help me remember and help me to remind others, there's God. How often do we do that? Teach them diligently to your children when you sit down, when you walk, when you lie down, when you rise up. Constantly discuss God with your children. How often do we do that? The faith of our children, and again, I, I know some of you are, are past raising children age. I understand that, but so think of your grandchildren. Think of your great-grandchildren. Think of my children because I need your help. Think of the children that you're surrounded with often. The faith of our children will not spontaneously appear. It will or it will not be developed by their parents and by those their parents surround them with. Why do we do these things? Look, let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses uh, 20 and following. Deuteronomy 6, 20 and 21. When your son asks you in times to come, saying, What do these testimonies and the statutes and the judgments mean which the Lord our God commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, When we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord brought us from Egypt with a mighty hand. In verse 22 and 23, he continues talking about the, the story of Egypt. Go to verse 24. So the Lord commanded us. Okay, so, uh, so he says that the children come... And ask, what do these statutes mean? What do these teachings mean? What, is, what do these laws mean? Why do you have all of these things? He says, well, because of what God did for us in Egypt, He delivered us out of the hands of slavery, and He brought us into the promised land, and He's done all of these things. Verse 24, so because of these things, the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always and for our survival as it is today. It will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all these commandments before the Lord our God, just as He commanded us. Why, parents, older, more mature Christians, things we need to teach children and less mature Christians, why do we do these things? Because of what the Lord has done for us, we follow His commands in order to be pleasing or in order to be righteous in His sight. Parents, let me ask you this question. If your child is as faithful as you are, Will you be satisfied? More importantly, if your child is as faithful as you are, will your God be satisfied? What example are you setting? What trail are you blazing? What are you showing the standard to be? What do children t today need? They need their own faith. But their own faith won't just happen for the vast majority of, of people, of children it will be derived from, it will come from, it will be the result of a genuine, exemplified faith by someone else in their life. Number two, what do today's children need? They need a loving church that expects and guides them in doing right. It's my opinion, and I think Scripture presents this, that we must expect children, especially those who have become Christians, there must be an expectation of all Christians to do right. Because when I, when I don't expect you to do right, then when you do wrong, then I really can't really say anything to you about it. I can't correct you. I can't guide you in a, in a better way. Not that, that it should be me, but that it should be us as Christians. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. What do today's children need? Number two, a loving church that expects and guides them in doing right. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 24. Uh, we've read this before. You know this passage very well. I want us to look at it. I think we've even looked at it this way previously, but I want us to look at it again. I want to look at Hebrews 10, 19 through 24. Skip verse 25. Read 26 and 27. And then realize, oh, well, that's why 25 is so important. Because we all know 25. Don't forsake the assembly. We all know that verse. Hebrews 10, 25. Don't forsake the assembly. You better be here every time the doors are open. We all know that. It's been preached to us. It's been told us. We've been encouraged with that verse. But why is it so important? Why should we not forsake the assembly? Look at verses 19 through 24 of Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and since, he have, have, and since we have a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith. 
having our hearts sprinkled clean from every evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our faith, of our hope, without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. So he says we have confidence. You and I as Christians, if you're a Christian this morning, then you can have the confidence to enter the holy place. Again, that, that picture of the Holy of Holies. Think back to the, the tabernacle, the, the temple, that uh, there was this, this certain part that, that only the priest could go, and the, and the Holy of Holies, only the high priest could go, and he could only go there once a year. And, and the picture that is being drawn here is that Jesus, through his sacrifice, tore that veil down, allows us to enter into the holy place, allows us to be in the presence of God. You and I as Christians, praise God, have the opportunity to come before God whenever we need to. He tells us to hold fast that confession without wavering because He is faithful. And if we are faithful, we can know that He is faithful. And He says, let us spur one another on to love and good deeds. Look at verse 26. Verse number 26. For, because, okay, we, we just heard all of that. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a terrifying expectation of the judgment and fury of fire which will consume the adversaries. So 19 through 24 say so we've got this, we've got this hope, we've got this confidence, we've got this, this desire, this ability to, to go before the presence of God and to be confident in doing that. And then verse 26, it says also uh, in those other verses, it says to, to hold fast our confession. Hold on to that. Hold on to that hope that we've had. And then verse 26 and 27 says, because if we don't, if we let go of that, and if we go on sinning instead, then that sacrifice isn't there anymore. That relationship with God isn't there anymore. That confidence we had isn't there anymore. We don't have the privilege or the right to go before God anymore. Instead, all we have is a terrifying expectation because we know because we had a relationship with God, we know what it's like to not have a relationship with God. And we know what we can expect. And that's why verse 25 is so important. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Why is it important that you spend time with your brothers and sisters in Christ? Because you need their help to remain faithful. Because they need your help to remain faithful. What do today's children need? A loving church that is present. Not only on Sunday mornings. Not only on Sunday nights. Not only on Wednesday nights. Present in their lives. Do the children at this congregation know that you love them? And that you love their souls? And that you want them to go to heaven? Secondly, turn to uh, Colossians chapter 3. A loving church that expects and guides them to, to do what's right. When, when we're present, we can, we can show them that we expect them to do the right thing and to be the right kind of people. But not only that, and here, here's the thing that none of us like. Let, let me ask you for, a, for a, a show of hands. Who likes criticism? Who likes being told that what you're doing is wrong or bad or could be done much, much better? No one likes criticism. But the reality is that children, and I hope that you'll notice this, and I'm going to have to say it anyway just for my conscience sake, Everything I'm saying today about children is true about you. Whether you're a child or whether you're an adult, whether you've been a Christian for a day or for a decade or for a century, everything we're saying about children is true about you today. We need a loving church that expects and guides us in doing right. And that involves constructive criticism. In Colossians chapter 3, starting verse 12, it says, So, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts with uh, rule in your heart, switch in you, you were called in one body, and be thankful. We like all of those things that were mentioned there. All of these things, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiveness, love, peace, thankfulness. Uh, all of those are necessary things, but none of them negate what is said in verse 16, which says, Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Part of being a part of the church is correcting one another. 
is teaching and admonishing one another. We need to, as Christians, we need to, as parents, we need to, as more mature Christians, to expect of our children, especially those who have made that commitment through their faith, belief, repentance, and baptism, and confession, that they, they say, God, I'm living for you now. We need to expect them to do the right thing. And when they don't, we need to lovingly and kindly, with compassion and all of those other things, correct them. But we must correct them. Because if we don't, they won't learn. In the same way that a child has to be taught anything that a child learns, a Christian child, a child of God, needs to be taught. In a, dis- in a discussion excuse me, on discipline in Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verse 6, the writer tells us, For those whom the Lord loves, He disciplines. And later in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, it says, He disciplines us for our own good, so that we may share His holiness. And then later in verse 11, he he describes that discipline as yielding the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Listen, I need your help to to raise my children so they don't run around the church building. I need your help with that. I need your help to, to help me raise my children to teach them good manners. I need your help with that. But much more importantly, I need your help to raise my children to be faithful to God. And every parent in here would say the same thing. And every grandparent and every member would say the same thing. What do today's children need? Number two, a loving church that expects and guides them, corrects them, points out the right direction to them. Number three, and lastly, what do today's children need? They need a solution to a problem. I've noticed a trend recently, maybe over the last 10 years or so, something that that I don't understand, and and, and some of you will know exactly what I'm talking about, and, and all of us will know the general idea of what I'm talking about. Today's children seem to be seeking permanent solutions to temporary problems. All of us have problems, don't we? Every day there seems to be a new problem that's presented. But many times today, maybe, maybe today all of us, but certainly we see it, or I've seen it, in today's children, today's teenagers, they seek a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Here, here's, here's my point. Some problems come and go, whether or not we do a whole lot with them or not. High school is a problem. Guess what? Four years later, as long as you pass all your classes, you ain't got to worry about it anymore. You can move on, praise God. There are problems like that that come into our lives that we've got to endure, we've got to go through, they're, they're just there. And we can, we can do some things with it, and maybe that'll help it go smoothly, or maybe we don't do anything with this, and it, and it goes just as smoothly. There's some things, perhaps, in life that it doesn't matter a whole lot how much effort we put into or not. We've just got to endure them, we've got to go through them. But eventually, if we just keep going, they'll be over with. But it seems like today's children want a permanent solution to a problem that's really not just going to last that long. And But when they're seeking that permanent solution, they go down the wrong path. And they put themselves in a very dangerous situation. And we've seen that. So there, there are solutions to problems. Maybe we can seek a permanent solution to a temporary problem, but let me suggest this. Instead, let's seek an eternal solution to an everlasting problem. In Hebrews chapter 11, you want to turn back there. Hebrews 11, talking about Moses. uh, In Hebrews 11, verses 24 through 27. Hebrews 11, 24 through 27. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called a son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy... The passing pleasures of sin. Considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. Moses had all kinds of things that he could have done, but he sought an eternal solution to an everlasting problem. He wanted to be identified with God's people, not with the people of the world, and to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Keep in mind, passing pleasures of sin, and let's contrast that with 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Turn to 2 Corinthians 4. Let's look at verse verse 16 and following. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 and following. 
here in a discussion uh, about the hardships that, that he, Paul, and his companions, uh, as well as other Christians, had endured for the sake of the gospel, Paul comes to this conclusion in 2 Corinthians 4, starting in verse 16. Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentarily, momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look at things which are un, which are seen, but excuse me. While we look at look not at things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Verse chapter five, verse one. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. In Hebrews chapter eleven, it talked about the passing pleasures of sin. In Second Corinthians, Paul recognized and realized that there was an eternal weight of glory. So we can have the, the passing pleasures of sin in this life, or we can be faithful to God and build an eternal weight of glory. Which one sounds better? Well, in the moment, what, which one sounds better? Pleasures of sin. Right now, it sounds like that's what I want. But the reality is that what our children must learn, they must understand that there's a big picture. There's something more than, than just right now. You've heard the phrase that you can't see the forest for all the trees. Well, it seems like children, and again, what I say about children usually applies to all of us. They're so focused on here and now, all they can see is the, the trees in front of them. They miss the entire forest that's surrounding them. That we, we look to today, right now, what can I do for me? What can I do to, to make me happy, to, to feel good? Instead of looking at the eternal weight of glory that we could be a part of. Whatever happens here on earth, Paul came to this conclusion. Much of it was unpleasant in Paul's life. But he came to the conclusion that the endurance of our faith in the face of difficulty only leads to glory beyond all comparison. Not of the things which are seen, but of the things which are unseen. Not of the things which are temporary, but of the things which are everlasting. That's a fundamental fact that all Christians must understand. That we will live beyond this life. That there is something more. And if we don't get that, then we won't pass up those pleasures of sin that pass away very, very quickly. We'll hold on to those and we'll lose out on the eternal weight of glory. What do today's children need? What do you need today as a Christian? They need their own faith. Derived from a genuine, exemplified faith. Parents... More mature Christians, what path are you showing your children or less mature Christians to follow? What else do they need? They need a loving church family. And that means that they, a church family that is, is loving and, and kind and, and shows them a place of belonging that they can come, but also expects them and guides them in doing the right thing. That isn't afraid about hurting someone's feelings, maybe even, in order to save their souls. Discipline never seems pleasant in the moment. But when we discipline through God's discipline, it leads to an eternal weight of glory. And last, lastly, what do today's children need? What do we need? A solution to a problem. An understanding of the big picture. An understanding that there is something more than even this life. This life is important, and there are so many important decisions that you'll make in this life. But the most important decisions you make in this life last beyond this life and last to the, the, the future. What's the problem for children as they grow older and as they become accountable for their actions? What's the problem for you today as an adult? Sin is that problem. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 623 of Romans tells us that the wages of sin, the, the result, what we deserve, what we earn because of our sin is death. We deserve to be eternally separated from God because we simply don't match up. And in and of ourselves, we never will. What's the solution? Jesus. Period. End of story. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus is the solution to the problem. And our faith to Jesus 
shows us that we have accepted that solution? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Hebrews eleven six tells us the one who uh, without faith is impossible to please God because the one who comes to God must believe that He is and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in God? Do you believe that if you seek Him, He will reward you? Do you believe His promises? Do you believe that God will do what He said He would do? He tells us if we're faithful to Him, He will be faithful to us. In Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31, we're told that we must repent because there's coming a day when we will be judged. All of us have sinned. One day we'll be judged based on what we do, based on our sin and based on our obedience or lack of obedience to God. Do we, are you willing to confess? Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and 33, Jesus tells us if we confess Him before men, He'll confess us before His Father in heaven. And if we don't, then He won't. Again, the only reason I'll go to heaven is because of Jesus. And the only reason he'll confess me, he'll say, yes, he belongs to me. Yes, this child belongs to you is because I will confess him today. And if I don't confess him today in this life and every day in this life, then I shouldn't expect him to confess him before, to confess me before his father who is in heaven. And then we're baptized. Why? We had a great class this morning on Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 and, and the surrounding verses and much was talked about baptism. But, but baptism puts us into Christ. With baptism we, we bury our old self and we raise up to walk in newness of life. We're, we're cleansed from all of our sins. Romans chapter 6. Again in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's for the remission of our sins. Our sins are washed away. They're, they're gone. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21 Baptism now saves us. Baptism is, is perhaps a, a controversial thing for some people, but in Scripture it's not controversial at all. It's necessary. Listen, this morning there are about 35 names on the floor. I hope none of these end up falling away from the church. What, what do today's children need? They need you. They need their own faith shown to them by you. They need a church family that loves them, expects them, and guides them in doing the right thing. They need you. What, what does the person sitting beside you need? You. What does the person on the other side of the auditorium need? You. What, what, what do we need from each other? An exemplified faith that shows us, expects us, and guides us in doing the right thing. It is my expectation as you as my brother or sister in Christ that you're going to do the right thing. I expect you to do the right thing. You expect me to do the right thing, hopefully not because I'm the preacher, but because I'm your brother. We need to have expectations of one another because God certainly has expectations of us. I hope these children, that are the names that are written down, I hope these children don't end up falling away. I hope you don't end up falling away. And if you're not saved this morning, if you're not a Christian this morning, I hope that you will be. If you believe in Jesus, you're willing to repent of your sins, confess Him as your Lord, and submit to baptism where your sins are washed away, you die to your old self, and you're raised to walk in newness of life. Why not now? If you need anything, if you're a Christian who has fallen away, even though you may be here every Sunday and every Wednesday, it's possible that you're still not here, that you're still not in a right relationship with God. If you need to get right with God, do it now. If we can do anything for you, we encourage you to come as we stand and sing.